This week's installment of Lost and Found looks at Zacchaeus, a man remembered because of a children's song about this wee little man. But we will also see that Zacchaeus was a complicated person, a person interested in God, but also conflicted in identity and understanding of self. And because of that conflict within, he was a spiritual wanderer. We see how Jesus is seeking people just like Zacchaeus. We will see how God's affection for Zacchaeus and those like him can change everything. Zacchaeus, you might know him or become uh, been familiar with him because of the uh, children's story. How many or children's song? How many of you have sung that children's song? You know that song. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. We don't have to sing the whole thing. I'm glad to know you're familiar with it. It's a simple, maybe even a silly song. And as adults, uh, you know, we might get distracted by the fun of the song and miss the deep, complicated nature of the man in the song. Who was Zacchaeus? We'll look at the passage, you'll see some of this. But he was a tax collector for an occupying force. The Romans had come and oppressed the Israelites, and they had set up governmental institutions, and uh, Zacchaeus was a collaborator with that. He was a man who had become wealthy from that collaboration. He's a man who may have abused his power in acquiring that wealth. And he was also a short man, a really short man, in a culture that looked upon physical challenges with derision. Now, in our culture today, when someone's really short, it's undoubted that they have been teased growing up and maybe even teased in life. We know that's not appropriate. We're above that now, right? I heard the laughter from a man who is not six feet. And at the same time of missing the man in the fun of the song, we miss the profound power of Jesus' simple actions and statements that children will get right away. Later in the song, we know that Jesus sees Zacchaeus. He says, Zacchaeus, I see you. And more than that, he says, Zacchaeus, I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. Let's see if we can catch the profound power of that as we read the story from Luke 19, beginning in verse 1. He, and that's Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. He was on a journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, and so he was passing through Jericho to get to Jerusalem. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to to be a guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask that by your Spirit you would impress upon us the heart of our Savior to seek and save the lost. As we look at this, this man, Zacchaeus, teach us what you would have for us, for those of us who are also wanderers or, or who have wanderers in our lives, people who are a mixture of things and, 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 and conflicted in their own pursuits and yet open to you. Father, give us wisdom to help them see who you are. Give us wisdom to, to help them see that you see them. Father, give us the wisdom as wanderers, those of us who are wandering in our hearts, to know that we have not gone beyond your seeing us, and that you call us back to yourself. Give us the wisdom to respond to that. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, many of you have been guests in my home, 
And you may have noticed that my kids love having people over, particularly my girls. They love it when people come to visit. They love it when other kids come to play with them as, as well. And, and whenever there's a planned visit by somebody, there's this anticipation that goes on in my, my home. There's the cleaning up. There's the arranging of things. And not just because we want to make a good impression, but we want people to feel comfortable in our home. And so there's the vacuuming, and there's the putting in the way of toys. There's the, the, the getting the kitchen together. Uh, there's dressing up for the occasion. There's prepping for activities. My girls like to have games ready for people uh, when, they, when they come over. And then once all the preparations are made, uh, there's the waiting. And there's the waiting at the... The, the front door, there's a large glass in my front door, and you can kind of see to the front uh, through, that, through that glass. There's large windows in the front of my house. And there's also some trees there, some, some or I should say, uh, tree-like bushes that sort of obscure the view. And I live on a very busy street, so cars are coming and going all the time. So there's lots of false alarms because they can't see real well, or there's a car that comes by and maybe is slowing down as it gets to the stop sign. Maybe that's them. No, it's not. But then finally the guests arrive, and when the guests arrive, there is this hooping and hollering, they're here, they're here, they're here. They just love it when people come over to our house. It changes the whole mood of the day, the whole mood of the house. And as parents, um, if you have that experience with your kids, uh, we, we smile at their joy, at the simplicity of it all. Um, here are our kids, they just think it's so cool that other kids that they think are neat and interesting want to come spend time with them. We've, and, and, and the joy that it inspires in them, I, I think that's neat. The simplicity of that, to be a kid again and to be so easily excited about something. And we say it as if such simplicity is not possible for us as grown-ups. No, as grown-ups... Uh, We've grown world-weary with the complexity of interpersonal politics, uh, living with scar tissue of betrayals and heartbreaks. We know it can't be that simple anymore. Even people we love, there's always a mixture in those relationships. If only it were so simple. The story of Zacchaeus shows us that with God, it can be that simple. Even for those of us distracted with the pains of this world and wandering into further hurt, God's attention and love for us, it can change everything. The simplicity of it. Knowing that God is seeking you and wants to come and stay with you. Well, let's talk about this man Zacchaeus. Who was he again? The gospel describes him in verse 3 as a man small in stature. Now, there was an economy in ancient writing. You know, for us, paper is just so throwaway. We print something out, we get one thing wrong, and, it, ah, and we just throw it away. Uh, paper was not like that in the ancient world. And it was prized, it was treasured, and so you, you were very careful about what you wrote, and, and uh, you only wrote the things that were necessary. But this is an interesting detail. He was a man small of stature. Why was that included in this story? Well, I don't know if you know this, but the average height of a man in Israel uh, in ancient times was about five foot six. Of course, nutrition was different, so people were not as tall as they are today. So if the average man was five foot six, how tall was Zacchaeus to be considered a small man? Uh, my guess, it's not clear here, but my guess is that he couldn't have been taller than five feet. And maybe he was considerably smaller. Maybe he had a condition. Maybe, maybe there was dwarfism. I don't know. But he was notably shorter than everybody else. And think about that. What impact might that have had on this man, uh, on a boy growing up in a world where physical challenges uh, we're not looked upon with favor. Michael uh, Parsons from a Baylor Divinity School wrote this. Luke's physical description of Zacchaeus as, a sh as short in stature is usually given scant attention in the scholarly literature. The reference is illuminated, however, when read in light of the physiognomic consciousness. 
which simply means <laughs> judging people by their appearance, that permeated the ancient world and the rhetorical practice of using physical abnormalities such as shortness to ridicule one's adversaries. And if you look at scripture, you see it over and over again. Uh, Jeremiah is uh, ridiculed uh, for, for being bald uh, in the Old Testament. You see other examples of, of that. And certainly here, uh, he was a short man and he was probably ridiculed for it growing up. This is the scholarly way, this... Uh, physiognomic consciousness. That's a scholarly way of talking about the fact that his peers made fun of him, belittled him, if I can use that pun, just like they do today, except maybe more brutally and with more serious judgments associated uh, with his character. He was a small man. When we talk about that, we say someone's small-minded. I mean, that's the way they were thinking of Zacchaeus. Nonetheless, despite his adversity, it says in verse 2 that he became rich. And we might describe him as a man who leveraged whatever abilities he did have, what gifts he did have, to overcome adversity. Or his peers might have said, well, he was a weak man who betrayed his people to attain the power denied him when he was younger. The scripture notes that he was not just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. His loyalties and morals aside, he had to be a clever person to hold that kind of position. So you could say, again, he leveraged his abilities to overcome adversity. In America, America we might say, this is a success story. But that's not the way his peers viewed him. And that's not really who he was. He was a wanderer. What sense was he a wanderer? He was a Jewish man. He had spiritual interests. But for whatever reason, he became a collaborator, a betrayer of his spiritual brothers, a high-ranking collaborator. Now, he's not presented as someone who hates God. He's not presented as someone who's in defiant rebellion of God. But he, but he is someone who has some disregard for the people around him to be a tax collector, maybe even resentment towards them. Wealth, back then, as it is today, is widely sought because with wealth comes the wielding of power, the wielding of respect. And Zacchaeus had achieved wealth. And he has shown himself to be someone who, who does what is necessary to get the things that he wants. It's shown even in this passage. He wants to see Jesus. He can't see Jesus, so he doesn't just resign himself to just being in the back row and missing his chance. He runs on ahead and climbs up in a sycamore tree. I want you to think about this. How many of you, adults, would climb up in a tree to see somebody passing through, to see a celebrity? Some of us might. Some of us who are really excited about whoever it is but you have to admit, there's something unbecoming about it. And this is a man of position. And he climbs up in the sycamore tree because that's what he has to do to get what he wants. He, maybe he's accustomed to doing that, being small, that you do what you have to to get the things that you need. Maybe he's learned to be self-reliant. Or, or he's just learned that if I don't have the power to do something, I ally myself with the thing or the person who does have the power. I ally myself with the tree, which is tall. I don't have power in my own life. I align myself with the Romans who do have power to get the things that I need. Now, it's not in the text, but it's not uncommon for people who abandon their morals or abandon their convictions, maybe even to a certain degree, abandon their identity. You know, people leaving small town America to go make it in the big city and they try to work out their southern drawl or their mountain talk or whatever it is so they can be considered sophisticated and that as they do that, as they leave that identity behind and as they achieve success, that often there's a sense of shame about the things they've left behind. Maybe we're even relationships. Sense of guilt, maybe even self-loathing. And it's possible that Zacchaeus felt that. It's possible that the subject of this very simple and silly children's song was a very, very complicated man. 
And whether it's for self-loathing or for some other reason, Zacchaeus has a deep longing for someone to come and change things. He's fascinated with this person, Jesus. He hears that Jesus is coming, and Jesus' reputation precedes him. He's a man who welcomes sinners. He's a man who doesn't judge. He's a man who shows love. He's a man of power, spiritual power. And Zacchaeus is curious. He's more than curious. You know, when I'm curious about something, I Google it. When I'm more than curious about something, I go and see. And if I'm even more curious, if I'm hopeful, I might even do something which is unbecoming, embarrassing to myself to see what it is I'm hoping to see. That's Zacchaeus. The question is, what about you? Are you needing something to be different? Are you telling yourself, hey, I've had some success in this life. And I've done some things, and I've left some things behind, but it's worth it. But deep down, there's something in you saying, you know, there's something not right about that. I should be happy with this, but I'm not. Is there some deep longing, faint but deep, for something, for someone to change things, change them in ways you, can't, you don't even know how you want them different? But they do need to be different. And this is what I want to say to you. God is seeking you. And there's something in you that wants to be found. He was seeking, Jesus, he was seeking Zacchaeus as well. Now, why was God seeking Zacchaeus? To judge him? No. To love him. God wanted to make him a righteous man, a man unconcerned about acquiring wealth. I mean, unconcerned about how tall he was. You might ask the question, doesn't Jesus have more important things to do than to meet one man in the city of Jericho? And you would think so. And through this section of Luke's gospel, Jesus has been journeying, really since about chapter 9, he's been journeying from north in Galilee, going to Jerusalem to make his final confrontation with the authorities down there to go to the cross. In Luke chapter 9, it says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, this is talking about Jesus, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is what this is about. There's a, there's a cosmic event that, that, that Jesus is, a, is about to enter into. His death on the cross, his atoning for sin, his putting the world to right through his death and his resurrection. And when the time came, he was way in the north, and he said, we're going to Jerusalem. And he set his face to Jerusalem. The most, and I would say, the most important event in the universe aside from the creation itself. And as he's traveling down there, he has to pass through Jericho. It's kind of like if from St. Louis, if we want to get to D.C., or if we want to get to New York City, we do it via Route 70, we have to travel through Pittsburgh. Not really a place of note, but hey, we have to go through it. And that's what Jericho is. He has to go through Jericho. It sounds like this is a side detour. But it's in Jericho that he meets Zacchaeus. Despite the magnitude of his trip, despite its importance, he notices Zacchaeus. Verse 5, it says he looked up and he sees him. I want to tell you something. You should never underestimate the power of being noticed, of being seen. I'll tell you a story I heard about a little boy and his grandfather. This little boy had a great relationship with his grandfather. It was close. They they would spend time together. They would watch baseball together. In fact, the boy grew to love baseball because he would watch the ball games on television with his grandfather. And when the little boy was ready to join Little League, uh, his grandfather was always there rooting him on, helping him out, you know, playing catch with him and, and, and rooting him on at the games and, and, and just wanting to see him do well. And there was this one game in particular where the boy... Uh, was getting up to bat, and he looked around for his grandfather, who had been at you know, most of his games, and his grandfather wasn't there. He was supposed to be there, but he wasn't there. 
He looked in the small bleachers, not there. Looked down the first base line along the fences on, on the foul line. He wasn't there. He gets up to bat. Pitch comes, and he connects, and he connects really well. And in fact, he connects so well, it's a home run. His first home run. And as he's running down first base, he's so excited, and yet he's still a little bit sad because his grandfather wasn't there. And as he rounds first base, he looks out into the outfield, and there's a man waving out in the outfield, waving his arms. As he looks, he sees it's his grandfather, and his grandfather's yelling, I saw it! I saw it! I saw what you did! And there's just such joy about it. There's joy in being seen by the people who matter to us. Now here in this case, Zacchaeus isn't doing something accomplishment-oriented. But he's hopeful about this encounter with Jesus. He doesn't even know what he's hoping for. And Jesus sees him. I see you, Zacchaeus. And more than that, Jesus says to him, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. He's just hoping for a chance encounter. But now, Jesus is his guest. Jesus, in doing all of that, pushes aside Zacchaeus' identity as a man of small stature, as a rich man, as a tax collector, as a betrayer of his people. No, Jesus, when he's in his house, says, you are a son of Abraham. You are a child of God. And there in verse 10 it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so doing, Jesus points out to us that these big things that he has to do, this cosmic event that he's on his way to, uh, to, to engaging in in the city of Jerusalem, this journey to Jerusalem, the journey to the cross, it is about us. It's about Zacchaeus. Because he came to find lost things and to save them. As I said before, God has things that are precious to him, but that are lost to him, and he seeks them out. And that's why Jesus came. And that's why Jesus went to the cross. And that's why Zacchaeus is important. And that's why you're important. He came to seek and save things which are precious to him. And the simple expression of love showed to Zacchaeus changed everything. Verse 6, this is Zacchaeus. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Verse 8, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of all my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. He becomes a man of righteous character. He becomes a man who is like Jesus himself. Now, I don't mean to say that love is magical or that things come easy just because you're nice to people, that suddenly they'll be nice to you. That's not my point here. But the sincere expression of real affection, God is going to use that to change selfish men, selfish women who have lost their way. Looking people in the eye, being with them, even if they're people like Zacchaeus, even if they're greedy, even if they're abusers of power, worse, they're cheats, they're liars, they're adulterers, if I can go into politics, if they're Republicans, or if they're Democrats, if they're Cubs fans. Looking someone in the eye and expressing sincere love for them can be life-changing. It can be as simple as that. So who are you? What has God redeemed you from in his trip to Jerusalem? And can you show the same love to others who maybe who look like they have everything together? Who are maybe reviled because they have everything together, they have everything they want. Or maybe they're filled with guilt and self-loathing. Might your simple act of recognition, your simple act of hospitality be a life-changing moment for them? 
Will you see that a simple act of love in your life might change you? Do you want to be involved in people's lives that way? Do you want God to be involved in people's lives that way? Do you want God involved in your life that way? He's seeking you. Will you receive him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Zacchaeus. And we thank you that for those of us who have seen the complexities of life but have become cynical and jaded that things can be simple again. Father, teach us that you seek us and that your attention And then your affection can change everything. Work that in us, Lord. And help us, help us to show that same love to the people around us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you found this week's installment of Lost and Found encouraging and helpful. As always, we invite you to attend West County Fellowship if you're in the St. Louis area. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., at the West County Family YMCA in Chesterfield. Until then, know that God's love is for you, and he searches for us all.